series of IP Matters uh, webinar at, here at Patexia. Uh, today it's my pleasure to introduce Lang McCarty, who is the principal at Vested IP. Uh, Lang is going to talk about uh, strategies for patent filing for startups. Uh, he has over 12 years of uh, experience in patent and uh, patent strategy, patent prosecution, and uh, before Vested IP, he was at uh, Ocean Tomo. He was uh, the director and uh, practice leader of patent analytics. And before that, uh, he worked at uh, uh, Knobi Martin, uh, a boutique law firm, uh, as a patent agent. So with that, uh, Lang, uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Right. And uh, just before you get started, Lang, uh, if anybody has questions during the uh, webinar, you can use Twitter. Uh, just use the Twitter handler patent startup and we will get to questions at the end of the talk. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so hi everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, as Pedro said, my name is Lang McCarty. I uh, run a Vested IP, a patent strategy consulting firm. Uh, I've been working in patents, as Pedro said, for about 12 or 13 years and uh, started out doing patent prosecution. I learned how to recognize a valuable patent uh, when doing this strategy evaluation transaction consulting at Ocean Tomo. And now I'm going to work mainly with startups, helping them build valuable patent portfolios as they build business and develop technology. I work in a range of technologies and medical devices, clean tech, software, etc. Uh, and so today I wanted to talk about the kinds of strategies that startups can employ in uh, when building patent portfolios. So let me switch over to my slides here. And looks like that's working. Sorry, wrong keyboard shortcut. Screen share. Yeah, for a second we lost you. I think you can continue. Thank you. Yep. There it goes. F5 starts the presentation and reloads my web browser. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, this is a, a dense, complex topics, so I'm going to run through these kind of quickly, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask via Twitter or uh, feel free to email me. My contact information is at the end. Um, so first of all, what do I mean by a startup? Um, I'm borrowing a little bit from Steve Blank here. So Steve Blank defines a startup as not merely a small version of a big company. A startup is really uh, a company that is searching for a business model. Um, you know, there's a few common things that we look at that might define what a startup is, but really uh, what we mean by startup is a company that's looking for a business model. So you have an idea of a problem that you want to solve and a technology that you want to deploy to solve that problem, and you're really searching for the right match between uh, the technology you can employ and what customers actually want. And in doing that, you're typically developing new technology or improving on some sort of existing technology. And that's really where the, the potential for patent development comes in. And so what do I mean by strategy? Uh, I'm talking really here mainly about business strategies around the kinds of business decisions that go into uh, developing patents. Not so much the legal aspects, but really what is it that, uh, that the business people need to determine, need to decide when deciding which patents to file. So a couple of questions that uh, my clients ask me is, why should we file patents in the first place? Uh, and once we decide that we want to file patents at all, how do we de decide which patents or which inventions are potentially patent worthy? And then when should we file? You know, we want to make sure it's developed enough, but we don't want to file too early. Uh, and then 
a lot of times I get the question, can't we just stay out of the patent game altogether? Uh, we don't really want patents. We think it's just a distraction. But uh, unfortunately, I have some bad news. I think that if you're involved in a technology company or as a technology company in the modern day, tech, uh, patents are ultimately inevitable. Uh, you may not deal with them in the short term, but sooner or later, uh, every company in technology will have to deal with them at some point. Uh, you can look at the successful you know, companies that are now big that made the transition from being a startup, uh, Google, Facebook, Groupon, Twitter. They've all had to come to terms, you know, after initial reluctance, they've had to come to terms with uh, the fact that they need patents and that patents really aren't going away. Uh, and despite what you may have heard, software patents aren't going anywhere and really neither are patent trolls. Um, I'm not going to cover either of those very much in this, but uh, but I think that's the reality in, in which we live. So the main guiding principle that I think goes into uh, managing a patent portfolio, the main thing to keep in mind is that you're preserving patent value for a future owner of the company. Um, these really aren't your patents. In, in all likelihood, the patents that you are prosecuting today uh, really belong to your future acquirer. They're not, you in most cases are not going to enforce them against competitors, mainly because it's really expensive and most startups don't have the resources to do that. Um, and you probably, at, you know, as a startup before an exit, won't license patents for additional revenue. You may do cross-licensing. Uh, if it's part of your business model, you may, you may be involved in some licensing. But you typically won't be using patents as sort of a, an extra revenue stream. It's very expensive to do, and it's a distraction from your main business. But nonetheless, patents really still can create value for a startup, uh, especially when developed and managed uh, smartly, intelligently. So how does that work? How do patents create value for a startup as a startup? Uh, one of the main things is patents really make the technological developments that you're, uh, that you're working on more tangible to a potential acquirer. So it's one thing to say, you know, we have lots of trade secret, lots of uh, ideas stored up in the technology that we've developed. Um, but it's another to be able to hand over a stack of patents and say, this is really the technology that's embodied in the product that we've built. Uh, you can also, as a startup, use patents to increase leverage with your existing strategic partners. Uh, you can use them to stimulate investment. A lot of investors like the fact that you have patents, that you've considered what aspects of your uh, system are patentable, what is unique about your, your stuff, and that you've looked at your freedom to operate. Um, and they can also stimulate acquisition. And if you build your patent portfolio with a focus on your potential acquirers, you can actually uh, get interest, and there are certainly plenty of anecdotal stories about startups being acquired primarily for their patents. So the main thing, again, to keep in mind is you want to have a strategy. Um, you want to file the right patents. You want to file early enough. Uh, you want to assess your freedom to operate. In other words, you want to look at patents that are held by competitors and maybe even non-competitors, but patents that may read on the space that you're in. And most importantly, don't stop thinking about patents. Don't stop managing your patent portfolio until you exit. Uh, ideally, it should be one person's job to manage the patent portfolio throughout the, the process. Um, you know, it's it, it's not something that you can do once right after you close a round of funding and forget about. You really you need to stay vigilant. So how do we pick the right inventions? Um, it's not really a question of is the invention patentable, but it's really how patentable is it? Uh, there's sort of a spectrum of patentability. Some things that are too broad obviously are not going to be patentable. If it's narrow enough, you can get a patent on almost anything, but really narrow patents aren't really valuable. And so the, the job is to figure out what is the narrowest scope that we can 
that we think we can get a patent for that will still be valuable to us as a business. And so this is another way of looking at it. Um, if you figure out that the invention you're looking at is highly valuable and is highly patentable, then it's sort of a no-brainer. You want to file it. But even if it's slightly less patentable, but still has very high value at the degree of patentability that you think you can get, and you really want to think about sort of your worst case scenario, what's the narrowest uh, invention that you might get in the worst case scenario, and does that still have value? And if that narrow invention still has value, it's still worth filing it. But on the flip side, you probably don't want to file something if, it's, if it looks really patentable, but it doesn't have a whole lot of value to your business today. And that's really what I mean when I'm talking about value. I'm talking about the value to your business as it exists either today or in the foreseeable future. Uh, I'll talk a little bit later about what I mean by foreseeable. Um, so you want to look at your inventions and assess, you know, is it core to the business? Is it something that you're using in the product today or that you expect to use in the product in the near future? Um, there's a temp temptation to look outside and to be able to, and to say, uh, you know, this is great technology. Somebody out there someday is going to want to use this. But really what you need to look at is, as you're looking outside, you want to look at, is it something that others need? Um, is it something that uh, not only is nice to have, but it solves a problem that one of your competitors or somebody else who's using this technology is going to actually necessarily need uh, that they can't do without. And sort of related to that, if there are a lot of alternatives, um, if there are alternative ways of solving the problem that maybe don't work as well, uh, they are going to be competition to this idea that you're considering a patent for. Uh, if there are a lot of inexpensive alternatives, it may be worth um, taking a pass on, on this invention. Um, so I'm going to talk a, a little bit about when do you want to file. I think ideally you want to file as early as possible, as soon as you recognize that there is value in the invention. Uh, so imagine that you've conceived your idea here. You've come up with an idea, a new invention, some, some new way of solving the problem. A few months later, you're going to prove the concept. Uh, at some point after that, you make a public disclosure. And maybe this is uh, a paper gets published. Uh, maybe you're just talking to potential customers, sharing the idea, trying to get a sense for whether it will be a good solution. Um, and then at some point, maybe using that feedback, you build a prototype and ultimately develop a working product and, uh, and get it going. But all of these steps have implications in terms of the timing of when you want to file a patent application. Um, outside of the United States, as of the date of your public disclosure, it may already be too late to file a patent application. Most countries outside of the United States are what we call absolute novelty, where any uh, disclosure or publication describing your invention before your filing date can be used as prior art against your invention. Uh, the US gives you a one year grace period and so you have one year after your own public disclosure to file a patent application in the US. Um, but that's sort of a worst case scenario. I think that ideally you want to file as early as possible after you've discovered the idea and recognized that it has value. In a lot of cases, that's even before you've proved that it you've proved out the concept. If it's valuable enough, it's where it may be worth filing before you've come up with a proof of concept. And the reason you want to get an early filing date is, as you've probably heard, the U.S. is a first to file patent uh, country now, and so patents are awarded to the first inventor to file, as opposed to the uh, first inventor overall. It's perhaps a subtle difference, but what it means is that it's worthwhile to get the earliest filing date for the best material that you can uh, for whatever you have at the time. So it may be that 
through the course of your proof of concept and talking to customers and building your prototype that you further refine the invention. But that doesn't mean that this was too early to file the, the patent application because you can always file second or third or as many subsequent provisionals as you want, each time adding the material that you've learned from the, your additional steps. And you can combine all of it together in your non-provisional US patent application and PCTs. So summing up timing, uh, file early and often. Not a good idea in voting, great idea in patents. Uh, file many provisionals, add them up into a non-provisional. At each of these points, you want to reassess the value. Each time you file a patent application, each time you learn more about the invention, you want to reassess the value of the invention. Uh, and ultimately, don't wait until it's perfect. Uh, it's OK to file a provisional before you have all of the kinks worked out. Uh, you can always file subsequent provisionals and, uh, and refine the invention before you file your non-provisional. So international. Uh, a big cost in, especially for startups, is filing international patent applications. It can be very expensive to file outside of the United States. Um, if you're looking at filing in the typical host of the five or six most common countries, you're looking at an initial cost of on the order of $50,000. Um, and that doesn't even take into account the ongoing fees that you're going to spend in terms of maintenance and future prosecution it can be very expensive. So you really want to consider carefully which countries you want to go in, uh, which countries you want to file your international patent applications in. You can use the PCT to delay making these decisions, um, but ultimately you're going to have to de decide to file in some foreign countries or none. It's a perfectly viable option. But ultimately you want to choose the foreign countries you're filing in based on the markets. Um, I think that it's wise to pick based on markets as opposed to based on where things are manufactured. Um, your competitors can always move where they manufacture things to a country where you don't have a patent. Uh, it's a much harder thing to move where the customers are. So uh, follow your customers. If you have limited resources, file in the one or two countries where you expect to see the biggest market for the product um, and leave it at that if you need to. And then what happens if the business pivots? Uh, it's often the case that uh, time goes on, you need, to, um, you need to change the the focus of your business in order to stay with what the customers need. And so to do that, you, you make a pivot. You change the focus of the business. Um, when that happens, you want to reassess your freedom to operate. Look before you leap. Make sure that the area that you're heading into is not going to open you up to uh, new patents that may read on what you want to do. You also want to reassess the value of the patent applications that you've already filed. Um, and if you determine that in the new, after the pivot, that those patent applications don't have as much value, you have a couple of different options. You can actually abandon them. It's, it's not a bad thing to abandon patent applications if you realize that they no longer have value to you. Uh, you may be able to get back your sunk cost by selling some of those patent applications. But even if you just abandon them, uh, as long as they've been published by the patent office, they will still be prior art to others and uh, you get a little bit of value out of that. You may also want to file continuations or divisionals of your existing patent applications to more closely read on the direction of the business after your pivot. And then finally, you want to seek new inventions uh, as you pivot um, at, as the business develops. So final points, I think I'm getting close to uh, time I need to wrap up here. So uh, remember that your main job in managing a patent portfolio as a startup is preserving value for your successors. Um, you want to file patent applications early and often. You want to assess the value of your inventions, of your patent applications, 
continuously as, as often as you can. You want to regularly seek out inventions. And I didn't really talk about this last point much, but uh, it's, you'll, you'll add incredible value by always keeping a continuation pending. The people who manage your patent portfolio 10 years in, from now will thank you for it. Um, so always file a continuation. Um, and that, that's what I've got, so I'll turn it back over to Pedram for any questions. Thank you, Lang. Very interesting. Uh, so we don't have that much time for questions, but one question that uh, a couple of people have asked is about the cost. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned uh, to file as many and as early as possible, but uh, usually one of the biggest challenges for startups or for entrepreneurs is in early days is uh, money and uh, capital. So yep. how? first of all, can you say something about the cost uh, for initial filing and how do you, what do you recommend um, sure. to go around? So, so since I'm talking about um, filing provisional patent applications, um, the, the cost of a, of a provisional depends largely on how detailed it is. Uh, you can file what I call a, a quick and dirty provisional where it's a relatively simple description. Uh, you can even write your own provisional patent applications. Uh, it's a good idea to have a patent attorney look at it and evaluate it, uh, make sure that you're not saying things that are going to hurt you. But you can file provisional patent applications for relatively low cost. At, when I say relatively low cost, I'm talking, um, I think that a provisional application can be around $5,000. Sometimes you can do it for less than that. Um, but each subsequent provisional doesn't have to cost as much because your second provisional, you can basically take the first one and simply add on new material, and then you're really just looking at the filing costs um, plus the little bit of time that it takes to add the new material. The filing cost is really only $100 to file a provisional. So the second or third or fourth provisional is not going to be an additional $5,000. They might be, you know, at that one, you know, one thousand or or less. So that's, you know, that that's part of the, the rationale there. Okay, thank you so much, Lang. Uh, we don't have time for more questions. I just want to thank you one more time, um, and uh, just introduced our next uh, month's webinar. It's going to be on defensive publication. Uh, Felix Coxwell from Questel is going to talk about it. He has 10 years of experience uh, in setting up defensive publication programs for uh, companies. Um, thank you so much, Lang, and thanks, everyone, for attending this one. We look forward to seeing you again next month for the next webinar. Have a nice day. Thank you.